All right, here we go. Salute to NBA Nation, CP the Franchise here. We have a special edition of the NBA Report. You know, Showtime Sports has been doing a really great job with their basketball division, and this documentary coming up is uh, no different, man. It's called Goliath, the Complete story of Will Chamberlain documenting the life of uh, one of the greatest athletes of our time. It's going to stream and it's going to debut on demand and stream on Friday, July 14th for all Paramount Plus with Showtime subscribers before making its on-air debut on Showtime on Sunday, July 16th at 10 p.m. Eastern Time, a three-part documentary. And joining us today are the directors of the documentary, Chris Dillon and Rob Ford. Fellas, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Absolutely, man. Um, you know, Chris, I'll start with you. Uh, how did you get involved in the project? What inspired you to, to take this project on? Well, it's, a, you know, this one is a mixture of um, fantasy of all the things, you know, like as a lifelong basketball fan and, and a lover of like complex, interesting characters and that style of storytelling. This really brought those things together in a unique opportunity when you're when you're doing a piece of nonfiction with somebody who, you know, whose life is like beyond fiction. And uh, and then the randomness of like, you know, myself and Rob uh, both worked with uh, religion of sports before on Shut Up and Dribble. And when this project came around, you know, they they came to us to say, like, would you would you take this one? And uh, and it was, you know, it was more than I think we even thought it would be. Wow. And Rob, how about yourself? Um, yeah, some of the questions sort of a, a grab bag of reasons. I think like globally, you know, for me, I'm always trying to find projects that like humanize African Americans. And that's not always uh, an easy, you know, thing to find in this landscape, unfortunately. So I felt like, you know, Wilt was this sort of mythical urban legend, Paul Bunyan, Bigfoot type of character that people heard of but didn't really know. So wanted to to, to really bring a human element to that conversation. Um, and the other sort of big thing for me is like I try and choose projects that make me uncomfortable. You know, that that give me a little bit of fear to sort of push me out of my comfort zone to grow as a filmmaker and a storyteller. And so for me, you know, Will Chamberlain and much like uh, Muhammad Ali, much like a Michael Jordan, it's like these worldwide figures and, and you get the opportunity to tell the story, a lot of weight comes with that. So that that's a little, you know, like, ooh, we got to really come correct and deliver on this. So, so I like the challenge that that presents. Um, and then selfishly, it's not so much of a thing now that I understand it's a real true story, but from what I knew from a distance, I know Will as a championship Los Angeles Laker, you know, prior to this project. I'm born and raised in LA. I'm a diehard Laker fan. So I was like, oh, I get to work on a project about a Laker. Like, this is something I've been looking for forever. And in reality, that's, you know, towards the end of his career, it's a smaller section. Um, but those are the three things initially and, and our relationship with religion of sports as well, obviously, to, to get me involved with the project. Now, one of the unique aspects of this project, something I've never seen before, is that you guys incorporated an AI-generated voiceover to have Wilt narrate some parts of this documentary. Uh, talk about what went into that execution and uh, and how that idea came about. Sorry, you you want to take that? Okay. Uh, so we, what we really wanted to do, as Rob said, was to humanize Wilt, to reveal the human being underneath the, uh, you know, fantastic, fabulous celebrity and like mythological athlete, basketball player, like who was he really? And so one of the sources that we looked to for that was his own biographies, autobiographies. He wrote three of them. And we decided we were going to use a lot of Wilt's own words uh, and have an actor read them, you know, this is sort of common practice. And we did that. And then we realized, oh, this technology also exists that if we wanted to change that actor's voice to sound like Will, so it would sound like what it would be if he actually, we got to hear him say these words that he had written, uh, we could try it out. So we were sensitive to the ethics of that because we didn't want it to seem like we were making Will say things he didn't say. But because it was all of his own words from direct quotations or his writing, we thought that, that might be appropriate, but we wanted to run it past the family. To make sure that they were cool with it, and so we 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 created through this company, Respeecher, some um, samples that Rob really worked to refine, um, and then 
we thought, you know, that does sound like Wilt. An actor is voicing it, so they're bringing the proper emotion and feeling. It's not a robot. And then we took it to the family. And, um, you know, because if they didn't want to do it, we weren't going to do it. And they listened to it and they they gave us their blessing uh, to do it. And and we felt it brought Wilt and his own emotions into the piece in a way that otherwise you would not have felt quite as much. And also from a guy from the 50s and 60s, in, despite being so famous, people weren't walking around with cameras all the time, you know, filming him, speaking about his feelings. So, you know, this was really his writings were really the way to get to that. But, you know, this is a visual medium. So we wanted to make it so something you could experience as well. Rob, you had said that your earliest recollections of Wilt was as a Laker, growing up as a Laker fan. So through your research and interviews, was there a particular wow moment, something that, you know, jumped out at you that you had never discovered before while making the film? Man, that list is is endless. I mean, that's like the whole documentary and then the other two or three hours that we didn't get to to feel yeah. but the highlight reel it for you is probably two or three things that stand out to me um the most and i'll just try to work through them quickly one is uh you know during his adolescent early grade school years um he was put in what they called at that time the ob class which stood for oddball we would know today as as remedial or special sure, education yeah. um and his intelligence despite his obvious intelligence Right. And it was done solely because of his height. It was a class mm-hmm. where you had all of the kids who were abnormal for whatever reason, whether it was height or, you know, albino kids or uh, I don't I don't I don't know the politically correct term for mm-hmm. short people, but help me out on that one. Mm-hmm. Um, so he was he was in the class with those type of people. But the, the, the bigger point there is man, it was a very dark period in his young life. He lost his confidence. He developed a stutter that ended up staying with him throughout his adult life. Um, and I think it's where he began to sort of seek public, you know, confirmation and admiration and the need for love. And he had a great family. Let's just, there's nothing, you know, problematic at home with mom and dad and siblings, but from the external world and sort of social circles, he was made to be like ostracized and outcast. And I think when when you have that information and then you look at the things that he's doing later in life through that lens it gives it a whole different perspective and point of view um you know from a mental health perspective that was something that was like very very like just wow and important and heavy to me to understand him the second sort of big item that i respond to was his push for ownership of the sixers um, you know, this is during Jim Crow. This is right after Jackie Robinson's breaking the color line. Um, you know, it's like black people aren't even considered full human beings. And yeah. this man is understanding his worth far and beyond that relative to business to where it's like, I am the reason why this whole thing has value and what people are coming to see. And as a result, I should, I should be an owner. And you've, you've seen the film. So, you know, there was a sort of handshake deal, you know, with one of the co-owners who was a good buddy of his and he passed away. And then the other owner didn't honor that. And that's what ended up being the reason why he came to the Lakers. (laughs) Um, But just the, the, the confidence, the courage and the self-awareness of his value to me is incomprehensible at that time to, to be thinking in that way. So that was something I had no knowledge of prior to the project. Um, I would say the last thing is like, this is just my takeaway. I don't know if it's Wilt's, you know, mm-hmm. feeling or thought, but with respect to the statement about um, 20,000 women, I feel like once you watch the, the the film and you go on the ride, you understand that almost at every point in his life, he was actively and vehemently trying to constantly prove to people that I am not to be fine just as a physical specimen. You know, I have traveled, I have culture, I understand wine, I know fine dining, I know fashion, um, you know, very, very Renaissance. And it, for me, was heartbreaking that we get to sort of the latter part of his life and he makes a statement or agrees to be part of a statement that physically, physically objectifies him. And that's how he is forever remembered 
for most people, at least until this documentary is watched. Um, and it's really heartbreaking, you know, because he he did a lot of great work to prove he was more than just this big, tall, fast, strong guy. And then he kind of put himself right back in that box. And so that was the most interesting thing about the 20,000 women for me. That was a little sad and heartbreaking. So those are the big things for me that stood out along the way. Chris, how, how about you? Well, I agree with everything that Rob just said. So let me just add a few others um, as well. Uh, we we all knew about Wilt as this fascinating figure, right? So that was one of the things that drew us. Is like this is one of the most fascinating people that ever lived. But I'm I'm shocked even now at like how much interest there is at Wilt. And then we, you know, as you think about it, it's like this guy is maybe the greatest athlete to ever play basketball. He shattered records from the moment he showed up. Like mm. that person in and of himself is somebody worthy of a documentary. Then he also redefined the way that athletes look at themselves and really was the inception point of player empowerment in the sense that like, we actually have the leverage and power. We're just not wielding it. And it took, as Rob said, the self-possession and courage to know that it's like, no, we're partners in this. I don't just work for you. You have nothing without me. That person in himself is like a fascinating enough person for a documentary. Then it changed the uh, financial structure of the league, rescued it. It was shrinking by the end. It had doubled in size and there was a rival league. You know, um, there is no league for Magic and Bird to save, if not for Wilt. He's all of these things combined into the same guy. You know, it's like, no wonder we're talking about him. But then on a personal level, I really connected with how much he suffered because the narrative that was told about him to help grow the NBA cast him in a light as the villain and the selfish egotist who doesn't care about winning to as a rival to Russell, you know, the noble team player that helped, you know, create a story that could sell the league. And it did, but he never felt that, that was reflective of him. And that really bothered him. And when I learned that, that really moved me because I, you know, I may not have a life that is similar at all to Wilt's, um, but I know that feeling deeply and I hate that feeling. And to know that he went his entire life wishing that he could correct this. And then the people who knew him say he was nothing like that. He wasn't really that guy. You know, he wanted a moment like this. He actually went to Frank DeFord who is in the piece, is a, his writing is in the piece. Frank DeFord is gone, obviously, mm. but uh, where he, he writes the headline, another big bluff by Big Wilt, because he was like, Wilt's a selfish guy. Wilt's, you know, like when he, when Wilt was playing. Later in life, DeFord met him and realized I was all wrong mm. and reversed that, wrote a chapter in his book called My Man and said, I got Wilt Chamberlain completely wrong. And Wilt asked DeFord, can you help me get a documentary? Because as Rob said, Wilt got canceled. It was the one time that he actually put something out about himself that wasn't even true. Mm. And it also injured him. You know, he desperately wanted his story to be told. And that really touched me. And you talk about the responsibility and honor for Rob and myself of like, all right, we get the chance now with the help of his sisters and his family and the people who knew and loved him to, to give him what he wanted, which was his story through his eyes you know, and you can decide for yourself if you think the stories about him are true. Which is why I appreciate the title being Goliath, right? Because it really, in watching this documentary, really spoke to his conflict in terms of dealing with the media and the public perception of him, both on and off the court. And that was what was so eye-opening to me, because for me as a kid, you always hear about, you know, the conquests on the court of Will Chamberlain, and yes, even the womanizing, but the the human the humanizing part the human part of it as you guys both eloquently stated ha was missing for for some time so I, I thought you guys did a great job in really putting that out there for uh, for the public to see and and Rob you you talked about you know there was two or three hours of footage that had to be cut so obviously the on court conquest had to be in there yes the womanizing stories but how did you go about choosing which aspects of his life, of his career to cover and, and what to take out? Yeah, it's a great, great question. It's super challenging um, because there, there is a lot and, and we could totally have done more than three hours easily. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's sort of a combination of things. I think first and foremost, as filmmakers and storytellers, um, 
we have to trust our instincts and our taste and the reason why we were asked to be a part of the project. And so it's what resonates with us, you know? So to your question earlier about what was important to us, those are sort of the fundamental like pieces that are, are building blocks that we laid down first. Um, and then from there, you know, it's stuff that comes naturally through the process, whether it's an interview or a piece of archive or sort of the discovery items. And then you also think about your your audience. You know, we know we're gonna have people who show up for this who are avid basketball fans and want to learn more or want to interrogate the accuracy of the stories we're telling. And then we have others who know nothing about basketball, but they know about the 20,000 women or he was in Conan with Arnold and he's just this household name, so, but who is he really? And so trying to find the balance of, you know, those two audiences. But for me personally, it was super particular to make something that would be attractive and of interest to people who aren't already like steeped in basketball to sort of brought, broaden the conversation around who he was as a person. Um, so I, I would say, at least for me, those, those were the, 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 the approaches to how we decided what to put in the film. Once again, we're talking to Chris Dillon and Rob Ford, the directors of Goliath, the complete story of Wilt Chamberlain, premieres Friday, July 16th at 10 p.m. on Showtime. You can also view it early. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, premieres Sunday, July 16th at 10 p.m. Eastern Time on Showtime, but you can view it early for Paramount Plus with Showtime subscribers on Friday, July 14th. Chris, you, you guys had interviewed a, a number of uh, distinguished guests from Pat Riley to Jerry West, uh, Billy Cunningham as well, it, his Wilt family as well. Uh, is there a, a favorite interview that that you have of, of the people that, uh, that you guys spoke with? Well, you're making me choose between my children, but I... Uh, <laughs> You know, Rob, Rob, I loved, I mean, Jerry West was very special, obviously. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's so many people that were very, Wilt's family was very special, but is an unexpected person for me uh, that added a layer of depth to Wilt that was so beautiful and intimate and poignant while still being a basketball person is a former teammate named Tom Macheri. Mm. Um, he told us some stories about Wilt, including the racism that Wilt faced with the Warriors when he you know, came into the league amongst his own teammates, you know, because Wilt being, there'd never been a Wilt before Wilt. He was the greatest weapon on a basketball court that had ever existed. And, you know, the coaches said we should give him the ball 40 times a game. And that alienated him from, you know, the white players who preceded him who had been stars and they didn't want to share the spotlight with him. Tom helped us understand some of these pressures on Wilt that because the image we have of Wilt often is with the Lakers, like disco dancing on TV. He's with Arnold um, that we think, you know, Wilt just had this gregarious fun life. You know, he didn't have those same pressures, but he did. And um, I know Rob has lots of people he would say too. Yeah. It's three that stand out for me for distinctive reasons. And I, I, I'll make it quick. Yeah. Uh, so Dr. Orna, with respect to the, you know, mental health piece that she brought relative to the 20,000 women state. I just, that was like, for me, it's, it's crazy. We're both basketball fans. We have like hall of fame, multi champion, champion people. The the person I was most like fanboy about was Dr. Orna. Yeah. <laughs> because like, I just love her show couples therapy, which is also showtime. I just think she's like incredibly intelligent and fascinating. It's just like, a master of her craft so it was a little bit of a long shot with the outreach of like eh, she probably is not gonna do this who knows how much she knows about will it's a reach but dude she was so fascinated by who he was as a man and how complex he was she read a ton and showed up super prepared so for me that was like special in the sense of like wow we got her and that adds such a layer of depth to the film um again i'm a laker fan so pat riley like yeah, that was yeah. the one where it was just like i cannot believe this is happening <laughs> yeah. you talk to this man for an hour yeah. about basketball and wield and championships in la it was so trippy but my favorite what i think is the best personally was unexpected was ray scott who was a mm -hmm. childhood friend of will who played in the nba um first black uh nba coach of the year um he is just like 
a, a, a gift beyond measure with respect to um, delivery and storytelling and, and factual accuracy and detail, all while being just like cool and fun and lighthearted at the same time. So that was like, it's so funny. We went to Detroit originally for two interviews, only ended up being one. And budgetarily, it was like, oh, man, you know, mm-hmm. this was kind of like going to be a bust. But then we got him and it, it was it was all worth it. So those are the three that stand out to me for those reasons. Let's, I want to throw in Michael Arizon as well, mm-hmm. who knew Wilt. And he's, he's throughout all three hours and he knew Wilt as a little kid with his his dad was Paul Arizon, the Hall of Famer. And he's, you know, comes back at the end of hour three with a story that I'm not going to spoil for anybody who hasn't seen it, which is so poignant and beautiful and um, really helps you feel Wilt as a human being. And um, and I, I really hope that people will watch and want to watch this to learn things about Wilt that they didn't know because it's full of them, as Rob said, and, and they should want to watch it despite the fact that Rob's a Laker fan, and they should <laughs> it, which I obviously it will, but... <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I went to Howard too, so I'm over two. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, we're talking to Chris Dillon and Rob for the directors of Goliath, the complete story of Will Chamberlain. Uh, premieres Sunday, July 16th at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. You can also watch it early for, Ma- for Paramount Plus with Showtime subscribers on Friday, July 14th. Uh, final question for you guys Wilt's stature in the pantheon of, of the greats. It always fascinates me because you look at his on-court achievements, a guy who was completely ahead of his game when we speak on generational talents, 70-plus records active in the NBA. They changed the rules for Will Chamberlain back back in, in his early playing days. But yet, the conversation usually starts at Michael, LeBron, some of the older generation will still say Kareem. But Wilt is still far down. And, and for a guy who accomplished so much on the court individually and also impacted the game, are you surprised that his name isn't really brought up um, amongst the greats? Uh, definitely after making the film, I feel surprised that he's not more in the conversation. I think and hope the film will change that for him because he is more than deserving of not being at the top of that conversation, definitely amongst, you know, the top three. Um, and even when I'm in barbershop moments since being involved with the project, I've changed, you know, because of of what I'm aware. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of that, again, it just goes back to this mythological element. It's just people didn't have enough media to see it, to have that resonance of, of what he did, but they still hear about the records and they see the numbers. So there's the respect because of that. Um, Ultimately, and Chris and I talk about this all day, every day, you know, before the film, during the film and still after, it's like it's an impossible conversation to truly land the goat or who's the best because mm-hmm. there there are so many subjective opinions. And, and honestly, each of them have enough material to make a strong case for and against um, my what I would say slash our you know consensus after making this film is. Um, Wilt may not be the best. He may not have won the most championships. Uh, he may not be the most valuable. Uh, but what he is for us is the most important basketball player in the history of the game. As Chris alluded to earlier, um, the foundation that he laid from just making it a viable business and helping to get TV contracts and rising the value of player salaries and teams and then creating the blueprint for the first black superstar of basketball that now everybody else is following. Like they're all standing on his shoulders. So you have to give him the credit for being the most important and everything sort of follows there after. And to me, especially after watching the film, I don't think that's debatable. Like mm-hmm. that's full stop period, in my opinion. I'll, uh, I'll go a little basketball nerd um, yeah. on, on this one. Um, I, I'm going to say that uh, athletically, no one has equaled Wilt yet. The stories of his athleticism in this are so jaw-dropping still. When Jerry West says that he was the fastest player in the league, not the fastest big man, right. the fastest player. Now, that's a guy who in size is 7'1", 300 pounds. So you're look, looking at somebody like you know Shaq 
young Shaq size, who is the fastest player and can touch the top of the backboard and can lift the back of a car. Um, you know, undisputably the strongest player who ever lived. If young Wilt is coming out in the draft right now, you took young Wilt, young LeBron, young Michael, young Kareem, everybody. And the, the GMs of today had to decide who should we, who should we take? Cause we're going to coach him up. We're going to do all well, like, who's the, the best uh, player in terms of their potential. I think they would take Wilt number one. I don't think it's even a question. I think, when we talk about legacy, we're playing the results. We're looking at like how many titles did he win? And I think there's a lot more nuance in that than uh, people want to admit. And a lot, a little bit of randomness as well in how those things play out. Our back wanted Wilt. If he'd gotten Wilt to go to Harvard, then there, Bill Russell doesn't play for the Celtics. Mm. Wilt does. And Wilt's got a, probably a bunch of titles and we would talk about him as like, well, here's the guy who broke all the records and won like, you know, eight straight titles or nine. And it, it would be like, well, what's number one? Now, is Wilt number one? I don't know, but I will tell you what he is number one at. He changed more than any superstar ever in the history of the NBA from the moment he got there to the moment he left. And despite being said that he's selfish and all he cares about is numbers and whatever, he he broke every scoring record when it re when they realized that's not the most efficient way to play. And they asked him to pass more. He passed more. And they go to champion, they, they go to the finals and they win a championship, breaking all the records for team efficiency. And when he's older and he's injured and they and he's got Jerry West and Goodrich and superstars who can cook without him. And they say, Will, will you not shoot much and set screens and guard on the perimeter? He's like, Yeah, I'll do that. Fine. Like he gives up his offensive game and they they break all the records and win another championship. No one did that. Like no one evolved like that. No great evolved like that ever. They, maybe they couldn't. And, and like he's in the MV, MVP conversation at the end of his career as a non-shooter, as a defender. He's top five MVP and he wins the MVP of the finals. You know, so it's not like he's like Vince where it's like, okay, Vince evolved, but he had to, right? Mm -hmm. Will could have still scored. He chose not to. Now, like, that's not to me somebody who doesn't care about winning. That's somebody who's adapting to the circumstances. And if his circumstances had been that he landed on a team with a bunch of Hall of Famers and a coach like Red Auerbach, I think people would say, yeah, Wilt, Wilt might be the GOAT, you know? But that stuff's out of his control. You can only control what you do. And I defy anybody to find a superstar who continued to be willing to change like that. And who knows, because yes, he finished as a runner up to, to Russell on several occasions, but in four of those game seven matchups, the losses were decided by nine points. So who knows if, if history goes the other way, maybe that conversation around Wilt being the goal completely changes. But uh, well, yeah, I think you're right. I would. And that's that's part of the point we're making in the piece is like is that should we be deciding who's the goat based on like a lucky bounce, you know? By you know, like it's got to be. You now, Wilt showed up. There's a couple of people, Magic, Rob, this is a video, uh, who showed up the moment they showed up in the league. Their team was um, in the mix for the championship. They may not win it every year, but they elevated their team to be in the mix. Russell, mm -hmm. Wilt, Michael. It's a tiny handful. I would argue Duncan, you know, the moment he got there, like the Spurs were in the yeah. mix and they stayed in the mix. You know, like it's a small list, you know, like Michael's not on that list. LeBron's not on that list, but Wilt's on that list. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, Frank. Yeah, for, for sure. Well, well, Chris and Rob, I definitely appreciate the time. Uh, the documentary was excellent. I enjoy these premieres and the fruits of your labor because you guys really did a great job on this. So I hope the entire NBA world enjoys it as much as I have. Thank, thanks again for the time. Awesome. Thank you as well. All appreciate right. It. Thanks again.